so that people can watch so people can watch this uh, later on at their leisure. Um, greetings to everyone, and thank you for joining us here today. Our staff team here at the Longhouse Education and Cultural Center are pleased to have you join us each day this week for a wonderful lunch, lunchtime discussion with Native artists in the Salish Sea area and their artwork practice and their recent public art installation work. This is the second day of our five-day lunch Zoom series, and each day our guest presents presenting art, artists' work in different mediums for their public art installation. So Joe Seymour will be our guest tomorrow. Andrea Wilbur Saigo will be our guest on Thursday. And Teresa White will be our guest on Friday. Our intent in hosting these Native American artists in the Salish Sea and their public art installations is to showcase some of the recent successes of Indigenous artists in being award public art calls for art but also to encourage other Indigenous artists to pursue and apply for public art calls for art, as well as apply for open calls to be juried onto public art rosters throughout the Pacific Northwest region. So if you have a question, um, we'll take questions. Uh, once Ryan is done with her presentation, has concluded her presentation, so you have a question you want to ask Ryan, please type your question in the Zoom chat box and Laura We'll read your question for Ryan to respond to. We are also carrying this presentation on Facebook Live, so you can type your question into the response, and Amber will read your question for Ryan. Let us know where you're watching from, and if you are associated with an organization, or you, if you are a collector of the artist's work. And today, we have Ryan Federson joining us. Ryan's bio is posted to the Evergreen Longhouse Facebook page for your reading pleasure. And once again, thank you all for joining us uh, on Zoom and on Facebook Live. And let's get this Zoom party started. Ryan, welcome. And thank you for being such a wonderful friend of the Longhouse and joining us for this public art Zoom series. The Zoom room is yours, Ryan. Hi, sorry, my browsers being aggressively trying to get me to update something. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I love the Longhouse and I'm uh, happy to join you guys today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll kind of jump right in. Um, as Laura mentioned, I am a member of the Colville Confederated Tribes. Um, in case there are listeners who don't know where that is from, it is actually from um, the interior of the state is an uh, interior Salish plateau. And so I am a guest on the coast Salish region. Um, the interior plateau uh, is a large area that encompasses through uh, central and eastern Washington, as well as Canada. I'm descended from multiple bands, but primarily uh, the Okanagan band. And I'm also of mixed European heritage. My work has kind of evolved throughout the years, but I've always had a really strong interest in public art. Um, I did a lot of projects at first that were kind of like temporary interactive projects. Um, I am interested in ways that art can be shared directly with community and not through a um, collector or commodity based structure. So kind of like my practice is really focused on as many people being able to see the work free. And so public art is a really great way to um, make work for community in a, in a way that is funded, but is also um, not paid for admission. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little, I'm really going to focus on just public art projects in this presentation, uh, but also thinking about artists who are interested and excited about getting into public artwork. Um, I've also included a lot of images that are, which I don't normally share with the public, which are images from proposals, um, as well as like parts of the process. So we can go a little more into um, how these works become a reality. Um, All right, so the first project I'm gonna talk about is Nexus. And that was created for the Prairie Line Trail, Prairie Line Trail for the city of Tacoma in Tacoma, Washington. The project was completed in 2019. And as you can see, this is a image of the site before the artwork exists. So this is a trail that's be, that was uh, commissioned to repurpose a defunct 
railroad line. And a variety of artists were selected. Um, if you are uh, pursuing public art projects, I highly recommend applying for projects where they select multiple artists, which allows you allows the committee to both select some people who they feel very safe, but also to take risks and give people first opportunities. So this was my first exterior public artwork. And uh, I heard, heard myself described in the uh, interview process as the wild card. Um, and it was a great project. I think they brought on four artists. It started with a, a kind of historical brief that was created by a commission to look at the history of this site. And it, that brief was funded by the National Endowment for Humanities. And then the public art was then administered by the um, Office of Cultural Arts and Vitality in Tacoma. So while looking at this brief, um, it had about a paragraph or two on pre-contact history, um, but it really focused on um, on settlement and on, on pioneers and colonialism. And so I wanted to dig more into the pre-contact element of the brief, but to look specifically at the themes they identified overall. And so for Prairie Line Trail, they were talking about how the railroad made Tacoma an intersection of trade, economy, the meeting of people, ideas, and the exchange of goods. But in reality, that was not a post-contact concept. Um, the Puyallup tribe, uh, who is traditional to this region and uh, still holds a large presence in this area, um, were located at a intersection of a lot of intertribal trade that existed pre-contact. And so this is an area that is uh, very abundant in resources as well as along multiple um, travel routes across the sound. And so I wanted to do a piece that looked at those themes but honored the, the history that those themes existed before, before contact. And so um, I was thinking about um, both as pre-contact trade, um, but also like a meeting of cultures. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm not Coast Salish, but I'm interior plateau. And so I wanted to make a piece that kind of reflected the meeting of uh, those two cultures. And I had this idea of kind of setting up a, almost like a play, a play store. Um, I thought about how when I was a child, I was taught in Washington schools that um, Manifest Destiny brought trade, um, brought trade and economy to the Americas. And so I wanted to cr create a piece that was inspiring to children that also undermined that. I, I liked the idea of maybe children interacting with this piece first, and if they are still teaching Manifest Destiny in elementary school, which I hope they're not, that it, at least they've encountered something first that, that conflicts with that. And so I met with uh, his, the historians from the Puyallup tribe and talked a little bit about like what kind of trade would be taking place, um, where, and to get to gather some inspirations for, for the piece. And so we talked about the place of many fires of which there was a painting depicting the site where there's kind of these large um, wooden posts surrounding areas where um, other tribes would be greeted coming to the area. And so I wanted, I reflected that structure in these wooden beams. Um, I also wanted to have the piece reflect uh, kind of like my art, some of my artistic perspective. And so everything is very um, kind of uh, clean and modern and contemporary. And is this junction between looking at histories at, through the lens of uh, a contemporary artist. And so I kind of transform these the posts into these very clean lines and then look, thought about making a, a, a site for a seating area that could then be engaged with. And so this is the first drawing from the initial proposal. And then started going more into logistics. Uh, the piece got a little bit less, both, both more and less complicated. This was my first piece and I was very aggressive with its scale of materials, um, perhaps a little too much so, but I really wanted to um, get a lot out of, of making this work. Um, and so it ended up with these cedar elements, um, 
the uh, an etching of a uh, the kind of theoretical pre-contact trade map um, and uh, two um, uh, nomadic seats, which are as well as a par flesh package that were um, used both in the plateau and plains. Um, and then this like bronze table set with trade goods. And so these are just some of the images from uh, figuring out the scale of the piece and um, looking at like how the piece is going to be attached to the site. And then this is the final concept proposal before I started um, working on fabrication. And so this is kind of like photoshopped and plugged into the site. They didn't end up using grass, so it looks a little bit different from the final site. And there's, of course, a couple changes. Um, but this is kind of like my first um, in color imagining of how this might look. And then we'll move into some fabrication. Um, in this case, uh, I worked with a variety of fabrication partners, including um, FS for the uh, par flesh box, which was made of steel. And I painted in my studio using a long-term enamel direct to metal paint. And so you can see I've kind of cut these. I made a, uh, an abstract design that was kind of loosely based on historic images of plateau um, par flesh uh, packages, which is a little bit different from the aesthetic of planes. You think you could see the other one was a little bit smaller imagery. And this one has like some larger abstract patterning. And then uh, worked with two ravens on the um, cast bronze for both the tabletop and the chair. Um, and then so there's in my studio. And then next up is in uh, two ravens. Um, <clears throat> I ended up purchased, at first I was carving this chair. And I was like, this is going to take so immensely long. And then I, so I ended up casting from a, from a real, um, from a real uh, willow traveling seat and as well as from real um, leather for the top. And so this is kind of in process I'm setting those pieces together. Uh, a little bit further on the uh, painting. And you can see in the backdrop, they're starting to look like the mosaic element of the piece. Uh, it also the it also involved um, some etching work on the cement, and so I cut this map using a plotter in my studio, and then we applied it to the cement, and then it was acid washed. Some images from installation, and so this was done with uh, Artec, and so this was I think about a. I think it was a one, some, some parts installed in different days, but I think it was about one or two days of install total for the piece. And then lastly, the, uh, the shot, as you can maybe recognize a little bit from the rendering earlier. And so this is the site um, just outside the Tacoma Art Museum. It's a little closer up. And so on the, on the kind of the table, there's um, dentilium shells, there's copper, there's representation of, of uh, animal fat, uh, as well as obsidian and um, cast glass um, that is carved to look like uh, bits of, of antler, looking at things that would be coming from different areas and exchanging across this place. One last shot. A uh, synecdoche was a piece made approximately the same time in 2019 for the new Burke Museum in Seattle, Washington. Um, now this was a design only commission. And so this is another method that I highly recommend for people who are trying to get their foot in the door on public art, um, because you essentially make a based on the initial budget from the commissioner, and then they, they project manage a fabricator to complete the piece. Um, in this case, I believe they, the site was spec'd for a glissé mural um, that would be kind of printed and then wallpapered across. 
uh, I decided to go a very different direction and it was able to, that was, but was able to match the same budget. And so here we can see a picture of the wall. Um, it's actually incredibly hard to difficult, difficult to photograph because it's so huge. It's uh, I think over 60 by 47 feet. Um, and this is a, a wall that the kind of you can, the stairs traverse as you um, traverse the three stories of the museum. Um, so for this piece, uh, I wanted to, I wanted to kind of break down some of the silos of um, a museum that looks at natural history, ethnography, and culture, as well as has a contemporary Native art collection. And so one of the ways I was looking at doing that was thinking about the connections between different motifs and the fact that what we see in culture is a reflection of what we see in life and what we see in nature. And so I proposed to meet with um, representatives from each of the areas of study um, and to look through the collections and find these motifs that had either visual or conceptual connections to each other um, and then create a um, kind of like a cascade of glyphs that represent these motifs morphing from one to the next. And so um, I started by meeting with um, the different researchers and got to look at a lot of really fascinating specimens. Um, I was also asking lots of questions about what the, what, um, what the kind of real world implications of the research are and looking for connections that way, as well as photographing uh, different motifs that you would see in wayfinding or in this case, um, safety uh, images throughout the building. So this is from my first proposal. So this was a process that was a little bit different where you um, presented a proposal during the interview that was fairly rough. Um, I was a little more thorough on it because um, in truth, this is one of the handful of projects where um, I had already been thinking about something kind of similar. And so was able to kind of like build on that idea in this site. And so this is the first image kind of really roughly um, describing this, this morphing of images. And then this one is a little bit, this one later, this one might be from the second presentation of starting to look more at what that might look like on the wall. And so these are all really roughly Photoshopped. And there's one kind of taking that exact same image that you just saw and messing with the perspective in uh, Photoshop to apply it to the wall. And then we can see the uh, piece being installed because of this kind of crazy site, they needed to install it uh, repelling, which is really pretty exciting. And so in, instead of doing a printed mural um, for this piece, I uh, proposed doing uh, vinyl uh, decals. So these were all um, kind of carefully designed in Illustrator as vectors, and then they were um, cut in vinyl and applied in these strips to the wall. So here we can see an image where you can kind of get start to see how each image morphs into the next. And so in this piece, the title is Synecdoche and it's encouraging the viewer to think about the piece as a synecdoche. Now synecdoche is a figure of speech um, where, which was uh, used a lot in advertising where you have a component part that is used to represent a larger idea and that through that you're able to understand a specific concept in more detail. So for example, bread being money helps you relate that you need money to be able to eat. Soldiers uh, represents the individuals reminding us that each pair of shoes is, a, is a, each soldier is a person individual person. Um, and so thinking about that as these as component parts that represent their larger fields and represent outside influence as well, um, 
starts looking at the, you can think about it as a game and thinking about like, what do fossil, how do fossils relate to oil? Um, how do, how does wayfinding relate to um, basket motifs, et cetera. Um, and then I also included these cut acrylic pieces in part because I just really wanted to take advantage of the, the lighting on the wall and to move out of the two dimensions. And because there's these giant skylights, this material is a, called fluoroacrylic and it pulls light in through its surface and it sends it through its edges. And so they both like literally glow and emit light during the day, um, but they also cast shadows in light and reflections in light, which would kind of bring some color and change to this wall throughout the day. And then here's a shot from below. And last one where you can really see that, that color moving across the wall in the corner. Um, next, I'm going to talk about antecedents, which is in 2020 for the Washington State Arts Commission. Um, it was for the University of Washington Population Health Building. Um, which partnered with the Gates Foundation. And so this building, a lot of the art was funded by the Gates Foundation. However, this was as a partnership, it also triggered 1% uh, capital funds for the Washington State Arts Commission. So I was the, the, the state's pick essentially. And um, this came from the roster. Um, the Washington State Arts Commission holds a roster call about every two years-ish. I think they're changing where they're gonna do a little midterm application. Uh, last year, I was also uh, helping out as a mentor where, not last year, I guess this was this year, um, where we could talk about people's applications in advance. And if they end up doing that again, I highly encourage people to uh, join that program as well as to apply for the roster. Um, usually about, five or 600 artists apply, but they select a large number of artists as well. And then it makes you eligible for, for projects through the commission's roster. So in this case, um, the selection happened without my involvement once I've completed the roster. And I just got a, a call um, asking if I was interested in the, in the project. And so there was a variety of sites in the building that were available. But um, this site in particular, which does not look very attractive in this construction photo, is actually where pedestrians enter the campus. And so I wanted to make a piece that was a kind of welcoming gesture and vision setting exercise for those who are entering the building to work. And so the Population Health Building brings together um, researchers, experts, and students from a variety of disciplines to talk about a single problem, which is uh, population health. Um, it thinks a lot about the difference in uh, lifespans for different demographics, both um, regional and cultural demographics, and why people in Mercer Island live, um, I think it's like seven or 10 years longer um, than people in Rainier Beach. And there's a similar uh, issue in Tacoma where people who live near the mall live, I think, 10 years longer than people who live in the North region and looking at like, what are the, what are the influences that are changing the quality and the longevity of people's lives and how can we address those? And so um, in thinking about the kind of like thriving of the human population, um, I wanted to draw back to um, other people populations as well. And it reminded me of a, uh, plateau origin story that um, I kind of wanted to loosely reference as thinking about like pillars of life. So um, this is like a first uh, a first image looking at representing the um, four-legged people. Animals, birds, the people of the sea and water, um, fish and shellfish. Um, the people of the land plants. Um, and then lastly, um, us humans, which I wanted to represent as, um, as infants. 
And then we can see this design moving a little bit further. So I'm combining a couple influences. So I decided to make the pieces a series of light boxes um, that were referencing um, x-rays and diagnostic processes. This idea of going into this place to work on the, the problems of uh, human populations. And when thinking about diagnosing and considering those, those problems to think about the interconnectedness of um, other forms of life. And so, um, see, I'm starting to work through some of the logistics on that. And so I designed each of these um, pieces in Illustrator. because so I do a lot of, um, I do a lot of my work digitally. Um, I have a background in painting, printmaking, sculpture, and drawing, um, but uh, digital skills are a way I bring a lot of this together. And so in this case, I was uh, illustrating and then these illustrations were printed on a film, which was then sublimated in glass. It's kind of looking at a couple of the sample test pieces. We're kind of moving towards um, installation. So these are these pretty massive pieces of glass. Um, they're uh, six feet by, I think they end up being four and a half feet. And they kind of slide into, they lift and slide into these um, light boxes. And there we can see an image from the final. And so um, I wanted to keep this uh, a little both vague. Um, it references origin stories that have kind of like multiple tellings that are very regional. And, and when I reference traditional stories, um, it's important to me that they're already, um, that they're already public and they're already that they're non-specific. So um, one of the stories this this references is, is the four food chiefs, of which there are a lot of um, a lot of public uh, tellings of. And so I wanted this piece to be able to match a variety of ones, but also to be reflecting knowledge that is already shared. So I'm not um, making decisions to share internal knowledge. Um, through these public pieces. And so um, in this story, um, there are the uh, there are these the, the chiefs of each of the, like the, there's the bear, the bear chief, the eagle, the salmon, the camas, and um, humans are being brought into the world. And when humans are brought there, we are an infant. And each of the life forms before us thought that we, they had everything they needed to survive, but the human baby was very weak and very vulnerable. And so each, each uh, chief gave a gift to humans to be able to survive. And so I wanted this piece to be a reminder that we are in in interdependent and that we can't just think about the health of humans without thinking about the health of animals and plants and all of their habitats as well. Here's a close up. So this, the, these are images um, of the uh, light boxes. A little hard to photograph with the light, you can see a little reflection, but. Last picture of all of them together. I'm sorry if I'm a little rambly. I don't normally include these many process pieces and usually focus more on the content of the pieces. So this is a little bit different presentation for me. I'm kind of rolling with it. So this, this piece is up now. The building is, I don't believe, open to the public yet, but hopefully when COVID's resolved, it will be open soon. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to talk about a piece in progress. Um, I actually, uh, this piece has come a bit farther along since um, last week. Um, but so this is a piece uh, for the um, for the a defunct brutalist fountain in um, downtown Tacoma. 
and it was commissioned by Pierce Transit in partnership with the Office of Cultural Vitality, and it's located at the Commerce Street Transit Center in Tacoma, Washington. And so, of course, this is a, an image of the um, original site, and they were looking for ways that art could reinvigorate the site when at, now that the fountain is turned off. And so I was thinking about this, this site, but also like brutalism architecture in general, and this kind of cement um, monument to uh, humans' ability to build something like really big and aggressive. But compare, I wanted to compare that and draw it back to the monuments of nature, which are exponentially more, more grand. Um, and so uh, I was also thinking about kind of vision setting for this site. And it's an entry point where buses um, and transit enters Tacoma. And so I wanted something that was very much like um, associated with Tacoma's identity. And so I wanted to make a piece that um, referenced the mountain. And so uh, the name Minitahoma is based on the largest glacier um, on, um, there's kind of, we, we call Rainier currently, but there are a um, kind of a variety of in, indigenous names for the mountains in, in uh, Lushootsi. And um, there's several, so I'm going to kind of, I was sticking with, uh, Tahoma as the glacier. And I wanted to kind of like draw that allusion to the space, but also reflect the, um, the theater in this space and kind of make a little bit of a play on set design. And so this is an in-process uh, image. Um, so I'm bringing both referencing the glacier and, but also kind of symbolically bringing the water back to the site that has been shut off. Um, and thinking about like layers of transformation. And so there's the um, paint with the falls. Um, there's this kind of like pop out sculpture for the sun. Um, and then um, the paint for the rails is kind of referencing like draw bridges. So it's got like the, the yellow rope and in a very kind of playful way. And then the um, purple is kind of referencing like um, aged wood. The um, flora on the piece are all um, plants that are indigenous to this area. Um, they have associations with um, healing and sustenance. Um, and I wanted to kind of apply those meanings to this um, kind of very uh, stark site. Um, and then the both the color palette as well as some of the design elements are um, referencing um, early plateau uh, embroidery. And I just really was in love with the kind of strange color palette and these almost symmetrical um, floral interpretations. And so I was thinking about that when this project came up and it seemed like a really good site to explore some of those um, some of those visual concepts. Let's see if I have any more images of it. I do not. Um, what has happened since this I was working on this um, presentation is the basins which were um, kind of throughout this site which are um, are empty and no longer using water are filled with a reclaimed um, glass landscaping beads, um, which are kind of like a bright blue. Um, so the site has this kind of like vibrant blue infused throughout. Um, and then there's also some fun lighting effects where um, at night the falls are all um, uplit and the floral components have, um, three of them have these LEDs that shift colors, which are the palette was chosen for colors that interact really well with um, light as well. And so like the wild strawberries um, and bearberry will vanish and then reappear 
or it'll come through the vines and it's kind of to make some movement and look like they were wrestling or alive. And then the lighting also affects the sun where it uh, changes it into a white moon by applying like a, like a just off cyan to that piece. So I think that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for your, um, I should keep this, no, I won't keep the share. Unless we talk about something specific. Uh, thanks so much for your attention. I look, look forward to our questions. Thank you very much, Ryan. That was wonderful. That was great. I'm really excited about your presentation. Uh, for me as an artist and in my having an industrial design, design background and also having an interest in pursuing public art, I really appreciate your presentation. Um, I also want to thank you for sharing about the Washington State Arts Commission and congratulations on being juried onto the Washington State Arts Commission public art roster. I advocate for the Washington State Arts public roster because I am a Washington State State Arts Commissioner. Um, and this year there are 14 Native artists on the Washington State Public Art roster. So congratulations. Uh, we're going to move into our audience question and answer portion of your presentation. So for our viewing audience, if you have a question you want to ask Ryan, please type your question into the Zoom chat box and Laura will, will read your question for Ryan to respond to. Um, we are also carrying this presentation on Facebook Live so you can type your question into the response box and Am Amber will read your question for Ryan. Um, I'll start us off with questions while Laura and Amber are gathering audience questions. Um, I personally would love to have a conversation with just, just between yourself and myself and my being an artist and a contemporary artist. Um, but I really love your uh, titling of your work. And as an artist, I have an appreciation for your titling of your artworks. Can you share your thought process in the conceptualization in titling your work? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lindley. Um, you know, I actually often name my pieces very, very late in the process, basically as late as I can get away with um, based on uh, based on like what to do for concepts at different stages. Um, but I tip, I have a strange process. A lot of times they don't they don't come very naturally. And so I'll make a kind of like a word map of all of the ideas that I'm trying to communicate with the piece. And then I'll go through the sources and look for kind of like, look, look for deeper words that have um, more added content and then kind of like develop from, from there. Um, so I always think that when the, when, the, when the title does hint to an additional um, meaning that that's really productive. Um, and so I kind of have a long path towards, towards finding that. Um, but I'm glad that you like them. Absolutely. Thank you. Does Laura have any questions? I do. Um, a question from Melissa um, on Zoom. How does collaboration with Native community influence and shape your art? Um, it does in different ways. And so sometimes it's um, sometimes it's really direct, like going to the Puyallup tribe and asking for an interview and then going through questions and like giving feedback sessions um, or th through um, sometimes native people on the committees, um, getting to have more in-depth conversations on the pieces. Um, other times it's through, other types of um, meetings or gatherings, like some of the uh, some of the thinking and building for for works happens through um, artist residencies with other native artists or elders, um, or through um, sometimes when I have a a question about things in particular, um, I might um, reach out to to elders who I'm you know, really value their input. And so on some projects I have really reached out to specific people to talk through different ideas. Um, uh, I've also um, looked at um, materials that tribes um, publish 
um, in order to kind of like build content as well. Um, like in a uh, piece called Unveiling the Romantic West, um, I used a lot of uh, first person resources um, that the Salish Kootenai tribe kind of put out. Um, uh, I've also worked with my tribe specifically on some research for projects with uh, like 900 horses. I was able to uh, access um, first person accounts of that um, massacre that were um, transcribed in the tribe's archives. Um, and then also uh, through, through collections as well, sometimes through uh, people who work in, in museum collections. So kind of a lot of different different types of ways. Great, thank you. And from Kathleen, have you ever worked in collaboration with another mm -hmm. artist on a major project? Um, have I? No, not not yet. Um, I think I've only done. I haven't done a ton of collaborations. Um, I've, you know, I work with project partners and sometimes that um, can really build how things turn out. Um, and I've worked on some collaborative projects, but they're usually performance-based for whatever reason. And then sometimes uh, there's projects where they select, um, like I'm also working on a project for the Washington State Arts, um, sorry, Washington State Convention Center. And in this case, they, and actually this was the case with Prairie Line Trail too. They brought on a group of artists and then we got to be a cohort, which is a really fun way to work on things as well. And so you're not necessarily collaborating, but you know that you're all making work that is in relationship to each other. And um, you get to be kind of like a, a, it feels a little bit like school where you had your like cohort and you're all working on projects. Um, but there's a little bit more directness on that. I would like to though, I, I would. Okay. And is there a medium that you haven't worked with that you would like to? Um, you know, I love trying new mediums. It's part of why I've done, I have so little loyalty to any medium in particular as I I'm always really excited by trying new things. Um, um, let's see what, what I look forward to. You know, I, I was actually thinking today very randomly how much I love carving things. Um, and I really like thinking about things in, in three, three dimensions that way. And um, I'm looking forward to, you know, working with my hands a little more. <laughs> so, you know, I've been working on a lot of these public art projects and you work with a lot of fabricators, but um, for both for logistical purposes, but also it's partially how I think about projects and how I design them. Um, but uh, I would like to do some more work with my hands. And um, I also maybe have an interest in mosaic. Um, I am working on a project that is technically a mosaic, but it's more of like a really rigid grid. And um, I'm not, it's uh, like the tiles are all being enameled in a you know, factory and then they're going to be delivered to like masons and they're gonna put them up, but it would be fun to have more, more hands-on on that. Um, I have some more interest in working more in glass. There's a lot of things I've tried that I want to do more of too. Wonderful. That would, I'd love to see that tile project. That would be great. And good job on um, transforming a brutalism fountain. Thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> I wish I'd added more pictures at the end because we just went back and shot a bunch. And I'm like, oh, such sexy, bright pictures now. But as you know, we have a whole campus of brutalism that needs transformation. So. Yeah. Luckily, you've got all those beautiful trees around them to soften it. Yes, yes. Any other questions for, for Ryan? I'll ask a question for Ryan. Let me pull up my notes here. Um, my question has to do with uh, the timeframes 
um, for your development of your public art installation proposals from the time of proposal to the time of receiving, receiving the award call for art and the installation. And you can pick one of the projects. Oh, sorry. Um, you cut out a little at the beginning. I missed the question on that. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, my, my question is, is um, what was the time frame for you to oh. develop your public art installation proposal from the time of proposal to the time of receiving the award call for art and the installation? And you can pick one of the projects. Okay. Um, so water wall is an easy one because it is complete now. Um, I'm just got one tweak left on it, but it's essentially done and it's August 31st. Um, I applied for that project right before the pandemic started. The orientation was the first time I met in public in a mask. So this is pretty easy to date. Um, so I think the orientation was then like March 15th-ish, like mid-March of 2020. Um, and then um, we took a ways to like get through contracting. Um, and then the, I think my initial proposal was uh, August, 2020. My final concept proposal, I think might've been, uh, I think it was fairly shortly after that. But anyway, so it was like in the summer. So that one started in March of 2020 and completed in August of 2021. Um, that Without the pandemic, that one might have gone faster, but we were also very dependent on weather as well as the construction on the site because the piece wasn't just the artwork being made. There was a massive amount of construction on the site. Like they had to fully empty all of the the planters to waterproof them because the site was leaking. Um, there's all these other things that were like being done to retrofit the site that like extended the timeline as well. Um, other, I, there's another project I'm working on that also started, um, I'm working on a project for the Portland airport. And it all, like my, that was my first interview during the pandemic. Um, so that was also in March. And that piece is completing, um, this fall and opening to the public in November. Um, there are projects I have that are on much longer timelines, um, but I'd say that's probably on the shorter end. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions? If not, yeah, I have a question. I do. Sure. Um, Michael has a question. Ryan, can you identify something one of your professors, mentors had taught you that you still utilize today in your process? Yes. Um, okay. So now to pick one. So I'm going to do a couple because I can't pick one. Um, when I was, when I was actually at IAI, I had an instructor named, uh, Ed Wap and he was a, uh, Comanche flutist and he taught a class on, um, he taught a, um, kind of like introduction to native or history of native, native art. Um, and, he said something in the class, which and a lot of people kind of dispute, but was very influential to me. But she said that the, he said that there was no native word for art in any in any language that like kind of like meant the same thing. And then you know we're this class full of art students, and um, he kind of dug deeper and talked about how like how art has a more integrated meaning in native communities and thinking about community purpose. And that actually had a really big influence on like the type of artist I wanted to be and really drove me farther away from object making and more towards thinking about art as a community service and not as a commodity production. Um, and then uh, Preston Wadley always said that you can't create and analyze at the same time that you need to do things in 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 turn, um, and so I think about that as as well. And then Joe Federson is not one of my teachers, but he is one of my mentors. Um, and he talked about the head, the heart, and the hands, which is also something I think about a lot. Um, which is that what you should make should reflect the head, your ideas and intellect, and you know, be thinking about rigorous concepts but it should also reflect the heart, your values and the things that you're passionate about in the conversation. 
um, but not to forget about the hands as a conceptual artist sometimes do that the that the making and the craftsmanship and that the work you do with your hands is also equally important to the other parts of the work as well. Wonderful, thank you. Right now I don't have any other questions. So Lindley, if you wanted to go ahead and ask yours. Yeah, let me unmute myself and find that. Mine has to do with, um, to what extent did you have a consultant work with you? And did the consultant come with the call for the award? So for instance, I know at the Burke piece, uh, at, at the Burke Museum, uh, Mike Sweeney with the uh, Washington State's Arts Commission and the Washington State Arts Commission Public Art uh, Program, he oversees that. So I've had a conversation with Mike, given the fact that he worked with you on that piece. Um, so yeah, uh, do you always have a consultant that comes with you? Um, does that come with the award or do you have to cover the cost of that consultant sometimes? Um. So uh, Mike Sweeney was my project manager on antecedents. So I, I think that's kind of what you mean, project manager. Um, so do they always come with one? Uh, they don't always. It's better when they do, especially for um, emerging artists. Um, in some cases, I've worked with project managers that are with the city and who are like administering the public artwork. Um, or sometimes it's with a public art uh, commissioning agency. And um, other times uh, I, I have worked on, some, I'm working on a, a private project or I'm actually working on two private projects. One that had an outside consultant that was hired um, in advance of the artist selections so that was for culture. It was really valuable to have them <laughs> on, my, on my team. Um, and then the other was working with an artist. And so I didn't have a traditional project manager, but I had an artist who was a point person. Um, I do know that some people will, um, oh wait, okay. So I guess the Portland airport, I kind of had one at the beginning, but then I didn't after the design was done. And now I have like a primary contact, but they're not really a project manager. Um, I do know that some people will choose to hire them outside um, and for culture sometimes offers that service. Um, I actually uh, am a team and I work with my uh, partner who is also works as a project manager and studio manager in logistics. Um, so I have the benefit of having that in-house. Um, I don't think I could do as many projects as I have right now if I didn't have that, um, that, that, that help and support to be able to do that. I think I would probably be able to do half <laughs> it's, like, it's like doubling my capacity as a person um but there are also agencies that you can hire that I think that if you're just if you're just kind of getting your feet wet um on public art if you don't have a project manager assigned to you that it would be worth considering um budgeting that and I would budget that into the art budget so if you are not doing that you are the project manager and so budget you're paying yourself for that work um, so it's not like it doesn't get paid. It's like either it's paying you or you're budgeting that part of the payment to pay someone else. And typically that is um, like 10 to 15 percent um, ish. They, it, it can kind of shift depending on how much need there is for project management versus how much need there is for the um, artist fee. So you can kind of like find a balance um, on what those what makes sense for different projects because it's, it's definitely not all across the board. All right, that was a long answer to that. <laughs> no, that was a great answer, uh, especially for me, who uh, is really interested in advocating on behalf of Native artists getting involved in public art calls for art. Um, <clears throat> one last question. Uh, were there any changes made to any of your public art proposals based on the realities, physical realities of the site? Um, sure, yeah, there have been some, some changes. Um, I try and research very thoroughly on my initial concepts, um, as well as um, the farther along I get, the more I like really do detailed research on, on budgets, because I never want to propose something that is unpractical, unreasonable, unaffordable, etc. And so I do a lot of diligence on that. But um, sometimes the proposal processes are shorter, and you don't necessarily have as much time to do that level of diligence. Um, or sometimes opportunities arise that are just better and more interesting than what you originally thought. 
deeper into the process. Um, but for example, I was at the Portland airport, I had proposed, um, I had proposed like these cut wood uh, panels for part of the wall. And then I didn't know how much wood moves over time. And that when you cut wood at a curve, it increases the movement as well as like with your gluing joints. And so what I had proposed was um, that there was better ways to do it. And that it was actually like, I was proposing something that like might move too much. Um, and so that got changed to um, an incised design, which is much more stable and was able to, to match the site quite a bit better. And over by from Facebook Live, we have artists that are um, offering their um, uh, thanks for you for sharing all of these wonderful words and that they find it very encouraging. And then, of course, Tina Wirahana says, Kiara, Ryan. Well, thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, Ryan. It's very it, it's a pleasure to connect with you here, um, especially given the fact that we are both Institute of American Indian Arts alumni. And I have to mention that because I served as an IAI alumni council member for two consecutive terms a couple of years ago. I also met Ed Wapp in Santa Fe, as well as Ed's mother, Josephine Wapp, who taught traditional techniques at the Institute of American Indian Arts in the 1960s. Um, so I want to thank you for being such a wonderful friend friend of the Longhouse and presenting on behalf of public art, um, Native Americans uh, engaging in public art installations here in the Salish Sea area. It's great to have you here. Um, tomorrow, for folks watching us, uh, join us tomorrow for public's, uh, tomorrow's public art lunchtime Zoom series with Joe Seymour, who will be joining us as our guest. Again, I want a big, a big shout out and thanks to our Longhouse staff team, Laura Vermilion, the Longhouse Managing Director, Natalie Devine, our Longhouse Program Coordinator, Amber DeVillers, our Native Program Specialist, and our newest staff member, Cara Briggs, Interim Vice President for Tribal Relations, Arts, and Culture. Hope you can all join us again tomorrow. Thank you again, Ryan. Our hands are up to you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Take care, everyone. Hope to see you tomorrow.